Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 29, and 30 is where we're going this morning. Matthew chapter 11. Very familiar verse of Scripture. If you've been saved for any length of time, you know the Scripture pretty well. And I've preached on it many times, but I want to touch on it again today. God has something to say to all of us this morning. So I want you to stand with me when you find that. We're going to read that together. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus speaking here. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anybody need rest this morning? Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. God, I thank you for your mercy and grace to each one of us. Lord, I have nothing to say without you this morning. Holy Spirit of God, I pray you quicken this mortal body and this mind this morning. Speak through me, God. Let me be a vessel that you can use today. God, I pray that you'd open our eyes and our ears and our heart today as people. We need you this morning. We need to hear from you this morning. God, I thank you that you see every heart, not the outward appearance of each one of us, not the fake smiles that we put on. But God, you see the, the heart of man. You see what we go through. You see what keeps us up at night. God, I thank you that you are the answer to that. When we don't feel like we see or hear or feel anything from you. By faith, God, I know that you're there. Help us all to know that. You know that ones this morning. You know the ones that are hurting today. I don't know it, but Holy Spirit of God, you do. And I pray that you speak and heal. In the name of Jesus, we ask it and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I want to apologize before I start this morning, just let you know I don't feel good. I told the men, we pray every Sunday morning, the elders and pastors pray for me or whoever is ministering behind this pulpit. I told him this morning, I said, I, I am battling today, physically, just down. And so, forgive me just a little bit, but I, I want you to know God's a healer, and he's got something to say today. I told him this morning, I said, I, I, I don't know of a time when I've come up here to the church, when I've had all my notes and I got up here, that I had such a struggle to go through the Word of God and get it in my heart and mind and be ready. So this morning, I just want you to know, I may not go with my notes. I want to do what God wants to do, and I want to say what God wants to say. I love you this morning as your pastor. But I know one that loves you more than any human could ever love you. And I know some of you this morning have a lot of questions. There may be some circumstances in your life that are just about to bring you down. 
and you don't know where to go. Jesus said, come unto me. Sometimes you just need rest in your body. You just wear out. Jesus said, come. I've been amazed. And Curtis, I love Curtis. He's our head usher, but an elder in the church. And if he's prayed for you, you know what a wonderful man of God he is. But Curtis has come in before. He went through a battle for a while on his job, just physically down, just struggling. And I've seen him. He said, I, I just didn't feel like coming today. I just, and I may have to leave. I don't know if I can make it. But by the end of the service, God had touched him. You know, when we're all connected, our, our spiritual man, our, our mental, the body, all of it is connected. A lot of times when we suffer sickness, it is because of things that we're going through in our life. Spiritual things. Spiritual things can cause you physically to be sick. And God can heal that if we let Him. There's a stubbornness sometimes that comes up. None of that's in my notes. I just wanted to tell you, God's... The enemies of rest, there's three of them I wrote down, presumption, presumption's one of them. The enemies of your rest is presumption, that I, I've got it figured out. I know what needs to happen. I already know. If God will do this, all he needs to do is do this. All that needs to happen is this. I presume in myself, I know my problem. I've self-diagnosed. Do you ever do that? We're sick sometimes and we, my daughter, used, I, she would get on, she gets on that WebMD or whatever it is. If you get on that thing, you have a symptom, you'll start reading all the symptoms and you're going to be dead in the morning because the symptoms say, I've got it all and I am, I, oh, Call the funeral home. Make some plans. I've self-diagnosed myself, and I'm not going to make it. We self-diagnose what's going on with us, with our situation. That will hinder you from having rest. You can't enter into God's rest because you're not trusting Him. You're trusting you, or you're trusting a doctor's report. You're trusting something else. I already know. Well, I've been to the doctor. Some of my own family, I've said before, well, let's pray. Let's pray and believe this. And they said, well, we've got to go to the doctor first. No. You need to pray first. I'm not saying anything bad against doctors. I've been to them. I, they're great. God can use them to heal our bodies. Nothing wrong with that. But when we depend upon them more than Him, we are messed up. Because I've been to them before. And they'll tell you the worst case scenario. Just to make sure you don't sue them. Well, we're going to have to take your leg off. You know, something just... No? I just got a headache. What do you, why are you... I heard that story of a guy that went to the hospital <clears throat> was going to have his leg amputated. And the doctors came in, put him to sleep, took off the wrong leg. Woke up, realized the situation, they had to come in and take the other leg off. It was their mistake, but he couldn't sue them. He didn't have a leg to stand on. So... <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> I told you I wasn't feeling good. It's the best I can do this morning. <laughs> Presumption. Number two, panic. 
panic. Financially, I'm having a problem. Bill comes in and didn't realize something goes, got to go to the doctor, something happens, what we do? I got a credit card. I'll pray about it later. I got a credit card. I got a need. I panic. We react to a circumstance rather than looking up and saying, God, come. Sometimes maybe we just need to wait. Sometimes we just need to pray and put our, our credit card down, lay it on our Bible and say, God, I don't want to use this. Can you bring it another way? I believe you can. I'm going to trust you too. I'm going to wait, God, on you. You might be surprised. Like Tony was talking about, like all of these were talking about. God's not short on cash. You hear me? But he's looking for a vessel that he can use. And he can get it through people if they let him. But when we begin to hold on to things, you know, sometimes money can be a wonderful blessing and it can be an awful curse. Because when we get it, I've met people that way. Wonderful men of God, women of God, when they didn't have anything, but when they got something, suddenly they were so afraid somebody was going to take it away from them. They got very stingy. It's easy to do. Think of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus. He thought he had it all figured out. He came to Jesus and he said to him, what else must I do? I've done everything else. Jesus told him, you've got to do, he started telling him the commandments. I've done that. What else do I need to do? He said, get rid of your money. Give it all away. Come and follow me. And he went away sorrowful. Dropped his head. He had great possessions. He thought, well, I'm doing wonderful. God's blessed me. God's blessings, what we consider to be God's blessings sometimes, if we don't let God flow through us, they can become a curse in our own life. And we can walk by spiritually pious and think we're okay. In reality, something else has my heart now, not him. Something else. It can be people. It can be relationships. None of this in my notes. It can be all of that. So often, don't we think people, if I just have a relationship, if I just have a boyfriend, if I just have a girlfriend, if I just have a husband, if I just have a wife, if I just have a baby, life's going to be better. We go from one thing to the next. If I just have that baby, two years old, you're thinking, why did I have that baby? I mean, that thing's running around here going nuts. What is it? You know? Why did I want that? Pray for a husband. Get one. Can't stand him. I wanted a different one. Why did I get that one? They're all messed up. You're not going to get one that's right. They're all broke. The holiest one broke, crazy. Men and women are different. Women always looking for that. Well, I read a novel, and it was one of those love novels. And if I just had him, you'll never find him. That was some other woman writing about somebody she wish she had. And, but she's never found him, and she never will. They don't exist. It's a fictitious thing. Men are crazy. If you're married, you know it. If you're getting ready to get married, you're going to find it out. If, you, if you're just dating, take your time. Plenty of time to be with crazy people. I am one. I can tell you. My wife will tell you. She'll get a chance. But panic. 
The third thing that keeps us from rest is pride. Pride. God, I think I got it figured out. I can do this. I've had a lot of people tell me that. I've known people in my own family that have said that. Well, God's too busy with all of the things going on in the world. So I don't mess with him with the little things. I just, something really big comes, I'll bring it to him. Did you know God's not a man? God ain't like you. He's not a man. He's not a woman. He's different. He's everywhere. He can handle every problem you've got. I stump my toe. If it hurts me, I pray about it. He'll take care of it. Amen. It concerns him because it concerns me. I'm his child. My kid comes to me when Zach or Lindsay were little and they came and they got scraped or they got hurt. I guarantee you, they came to me crying. I picked them up. I knew it wasn't life-threatening. I knew it wasn't anything major. It might have took a band-aid, maybe just me to hug them. But I was concerned about it because it made them cry. And I wanted them to know, Dad's here. And if it's something bad, I'm going to take care of it. If you got a broken arm, you know. I was working one time. Lindsay broke hers. But they came by and I, I got to go up with them. But Zach broke his wrist one time. I got to go with him up. Teresa couldn't even go in. It, he was trying to dunk a basketball. Don't ever do this. Don't get on the hood of a car and jump up to dunk a basketball. Don't work. Zach will give you information about that later. <laughs> Pride will keep you from entering. He still can't dunk a basketball very good. But... There's three things that Jesus says to all of us. And that's my message title. I hadn't even told you, but my message title is this, Come, Follow, Abide. Three things Jesus said. He always says to all of us, Come, come to me. Come to me. That's for those who, he says that to the general public, everybody. Come to me. If you need rest, if you're dealing with something you can't hardly handle, Jesus said, come to me. If you're lost, come. I want you to come. I can bring rest to your life. I can bring it. That's those people that are just walking around. You may be in here today and you don't really know Jesus as Lord and Savior. He's telling you to come. Come to me. The world. We go to the world for everything. Give me the answers I need. Jesus said, come to me. I've got them all. Most of the things they give you in this world are going to hurt you. What He gives you will help you. It will heal you. It will strengthen you. He knows that. He knows the things, the missteps that we make. He loves you. And he says to us, come. Sometimes it just takes, I mean, I, I've known people. Well, I'll just say like Moses, for instance. Moses, until he turned aside. The Bible said when he saw that burning bush, he turned aside. When he turned aside to see that great sight, then God spoke. Jesus is waiting for us to come to Him. Come to Him. I'm just going to read this story real quick in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. It says, And He went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto Him, and He taught them. And as He passed by, He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the seat, receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. It came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in the house, many publicans and sinners sat also 
together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Let me tell you something. All of us are sick. Not a human being that's not sick with sin. Jesus said, come to me. He walked by. He's got, if you read chapter 1 of Mark, you'll find out that a, a leper came to him and said, if you'll heal me, you can. I know you will. You, I mean, I know you can. Jesus said, I can and I will. And he touched him and healed him. And there's one thing about sin that you have to deal with. There's a private shame of sin. Isn't it? It's only you know how bad sin is in your, your own life. You know. And there's a, there's a private shame to that. But there's also a public disgrace that sin brings. A public disgrace. You can tell people walking down the street sometimes that are drug addicts, can't you? The way they're dressed, the way they look, their eyes. I've seen people come into this church, and I can tell you they're high by looking in their eyes. I know they're high. But you know what I do to those people? I hug them just like I hug you. Because Jesus, the difference in him and everybody else in his day was that he loved everybody. Come unto me all. That's what he said. All ye. That labor and are heavy laden. We're all laboring and we're heavy laden. He said, come to me, everybody that's sick. I'll heal you. So he shows up, and here is a publican named Levi. Now, he's, he's a guy that sits at the receipt of customs. <clears throat> I was reading a commentary about it. It said that they would almost like buying a little hot dog stand and setting it up somewhere. <clears throat> they, would, they would pay for this place and then they would sit there in a little booth and they would charge people who came, if you've ever been through customs before at an airport, they would ask you, what do you have? And they'd charge taxes on that. And so he was making a living at it and he could charge kind of what he wanted to. He had to give a certain amount to the government, but he made sure he got his. And if they looked like they had a lot of clothes, he got, you know, a nice stuff, he got more money than he did from... You know, everybody hated him. He had a personal sin because he was a Jew and he wasn't supposed to do that. And the Jews hated him for it. And I can guarantee you the only people that hung around him were other people just like him. He didn't have good friends. A drug addict's going to hang around people who are drug addicts. Alcoholics are going to hang around people who drink. And that's the truth. We hang around, we, we just kind of go to the people we're like. And so the prostitutes and the sinners and all of those, they were all, that was his friendships. And Jesus showed up, and there was something, either he had heard about Jesus or something. Jesus walked by. Isn't it amazing that when we are just doing our job during the day, but we're not happy with our life? That Jesus shows up somewhere down the line? Maybe in somebody you work with that will say something to you about Jesus or pray or you see some kids at school pray at the lunchroom. Something goes on and suddenly you realize Jesus is alive and He's real and He's come to me. And so Levi looks up and he sees Jesus and something about Him made him look. 
Sometimes coming to Jesus is just looking at Him. Just looking at Him. He probably heard of Him. Many people as He saw coming in and out. And He says, Jesus says to him, Come. Follow me. See, there's three stages to a Christian's walk. Number one is come to Jesus. Come just like you are. He didn't tell him, when you get, if you'll get rid of all this stuff here, then you can come follow me. He didn't say that. He said, you come now. Come follow me. Isn't it amazing in the Bible that they just left everything? He left everything and he got up and he just followed Jesus. When we come to Jesus, we have to make a decision. There's a decision when we come. That is, I'm going to follow you or I'm not. If I decide to follow you, that means salvation. That means I have to lay my life down. Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny himself. What did Levi do? He left everything. I'm, I'm leaving here. What's your cross? When you take up your cross, you lay down your life, your desires, your wants, all of those things, and I take up my cross. What is that? That's the cross to know I'm going to fight this flesh the rest of my life. You know it. You fight your flesh. The biggest battle you ever have is you. It'll always be. But I know when I take up my cross that Jesus is going to help me overcome this flesh and the devil that attacks. The devil gets blamed for a lot of stuff he never does. That's just us. He does enough. Our cross. I'm going to be in a battle. My family may not like it because I'm turning to Christ. People on my job are going to ridicule me, make fun of me. People at school are going to make fun of me. Whatever, wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing, I have to make a decision. My cross is I'm following Christ. I'm going to go with Him no matter where it is, how hard it gets. It gets hard sometimes because people don't like Jesus today. Guess what? They didn't like Him then either. Matthew who was Levi. His name was Levi. He threw a big party for all of his friends. A going away party. He said, you see this Levi? All you people, I want you to meet Jesus Christ. Because I met him. And I'm not Levi anymore. I'm Matthew. That personal hurt, shame, you know what Matthew means? Gift of God. He changed his name from Levi to Matthew. You know who wrote the book of Matthew? Old Levi, new Matthew. Jesus wants to change your name. If you're lost, you hear me? If you don't know him, he wants to change you. Gift of God. He went from somebody that everybody despised to they said, Matthew, hey, you're no longer that despised person. You're a gift of God. Every time Jesus called his name, isn't that something? Wouldn't you like that? Jesus, come here, gift of God. You're a gift of God. God has a plan for your life, and he has a plan for mine. We're no longer what we were. I don't have to live like I was. I don't have to be who I used to be. I can be somebody different. I don't have to walk in shame. Some of you still walking in shame from... A failure. 
whether it was a marriage, a divorce, or some kind of physical thing. There's a lot of different issues in our lives that hurt us. We make choices every day. You chose this morning to come to church, but you, I don't know what you chose to eat for breakfast. I don't know if you ate anything. I'm listening for growling stomachs, but I don't know. But you choose every day. I've been exercising this week. I haven't lost one pound. Why? Because I chose to eat cookies yesterday. I eat cookies. Thinking I'm going around that track, running around that track, sweating like a dog, get back and eat cookies last night. Drank a big glass of milk. It was good. I got on the scale this morning and I thought, stinking cookies. <laughs> Wasn't my fault. It was a cookie's fault. Although I had to search to find them. You make choices every day. Some of them are good, some of them are not. Some of them are life-threatening choices, you know what I mean? They put us in different directions here and there. But God is a healer. He's a deliverer. And he can change your path. He can change your path. Jesus said this, John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into a fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now Jesus, three places he wants us to be. Number one, come to him. Number two, follow him. When you first get saved, the first thing, you don't really know what to do. You don't know all the lingo. And he's not expecting you to bear much fruit. I have people that get saved, and the first thing they want to do is go, you know, I want to go back to my friends and tell them all about Jesus. And I said, you better sit down. You better sit down for a little while and let you follow Jesus for a little while. You follow him. You read the Bible about who Jesus is. You get to know who he is, and you follow him for a little while, and then you begin to ob abide in him. These roses out here, pretty roses. Jesus said in that, God is the husbandman. He's the one who cuts those things. If they're not producing, he'll cut them off. That's me and you. He's cutting on us. And we go, ah! Oh! Sometimes when I cut those roses, I'm thinking, if they, were, if they really could talk, they would be screaming right now. Ah! Oh! What you're going through sometimes is that. God's pruning you and making you to produce fruit. But you can't produce fruit. The fruit on those roses out there come from the ground up. They come through that vine. They come out into those branches, but those branches by themselves can't produce anything. You can't produce it. So God wants us tied into him, looking at him. We keep looking at everything else. Well, God wants me to do this, and God wants me to do that. 
And God said, no, I just want you to look at me. I just want you to pay attention to me. I want you to be tied into me. I'm the one that will produce fruit through you. You don't have to do nothing but follow me. But God wants me to do this great, wonderful thing. No, he doesn't. He wants to do great, wonderful things through you. But he don't need you to. He needs you to love him. Keep your eyes on him. Walk with him. He'll do the producing, not you. Not me. Religion makes us produce fruit. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus, that's abiding. As a Christian, we are to come to him, follow him, and abide with him. So often we think we can do it on our own, pull ourselves off of the, of the vine, and, and I'm a branch, I can do it all by myself. You can't. I cut those branches off, they just wither and die. You can do nothing. Same thing. We can do nothing without him. Don't let the enemy make you feel like, number one, that God's mad at you and he doesn't love you. Or he's not hearing your prayers. That's a lie. Why am I going through this trouble? I don't know. I don't know. He knows. He'll never put on me more than I can bear. I've been real close. I've screamed out, God, I don't think I can bear me any. I think you went too far this time. But he always gives you the strength to walk through what you have to walk through. I don't know where you are this morning and what's going on, but I'll tell you this. He knows. And I think to some of us this morning, he's saying, you're, you're trying to do it without me. You're trying to come up with the answers without me. And you can't. I had so many wonderful notes. Maybe for another day. God loves you this morning. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on. You don't know where I'm at and what's going on with me. But I know he knows. And I know he knows where you are. And I know that he's reaching down this morning for you and for me. And all he wants us to do is respond to him. And if you're looking at something else, if you're looking at a different way, let me tell you this morning, he's telling us, get your eyes back on him. Look back at him. It's the only way. He will see you through it. He will see you through it. Would you stand with me this morning?